welcome back. Today we're going to cover Pug. Pug is an HTML-like language. It represents HTML tags, but uses a different syntax and a webpack loader to transpile the Pug notation into HTML. The main features of Pug are CSS selector element definitions, file includes, mixins, expressions, extensibility, etc. Pug used to be called Jade until it got sued for naming rights. It renamed itself to Pug recently, but the two names are pretty synonymous at this point. The full API can be found at the website attached here. To install Pug, we'll be adding Pug to our NPM dependencies as well as its loader. So if you perform an NPM install hyphen hyphen save dev to save those to dev dependencies and then include Pug, Puglint, and Pug loader, that will create the NPM modules necessary to execute Pug transpiling. I've also installed Puglint, but that's optional. I use them in tandem with my VS Code plugin for Puglinting. Now we'll have to tell Webpack to register the Pug loader for all .pug extensions in order to perform transpiling on those Pug files. To do that, we simply add a loader to our loaders collection in our webpack.config.js, and the regular expression provided above is for the .pug attachment, and we'll be using the pug loader. And at this point, pug can now be imported into JavaScript files via import statements. The basic syntax of pug is as follows. It's very similar to that of HTML, but there is no need for closing tags. Also, CSS selectors are used to define elements, and nesting elements is performed by indenting an element declaration on the next line. Next, we'll cover how to define elements. To define an element, you simply declare it by providing a tag name. So here we have a section nested inside a span, nested inside a div. The HTML is as you would expect it to be with the closing tags and, and all the extra brackets. Next, we can use class notation. If you use dot class name to add a, a class to an element, it'll render the tag with that class attribute set to whatever list of classes you provided. So here we have span.bold, which gets transpiled to span class equals bold. If you have a div with classes on it, you can actually drop the div tag and use just dot class name. This here's an example of that, where it produces a div with the class equals class name. Next, we'll cover IDs. IDs can be defined on an element using CSS selectors, so the, the pound sign ID name, as well as, as you would with class names. So here we have pound sum ID, which produces a div ID equals sum ID. This is very similar to how we would have seen the class above. Next, we'll cover attributes. Attributes are declared basically as you would in HTML, but instead of providing them inside the tag declaration, we actually surround the, the attribute list with parentheses. So here we have a P element with my attribute equals test, and then the text inside that is going to be hello comma Evan. So here we, you can see the HTML p my attribute is equal to test with the interior content being hello evan any number of attributes can be added separated by a space or a comma next we're going to cover interpolation in pug so this is similar to a template string where you can perform interpolation um, by using the pound sign bracket and then the variable name in a template string this would be equivalent to doing dollar sign curly braces and then the uh, the variable. So when you render the template above with a contextual object containing a property name, it will render the name as uh, you passed into the render function. So you can see here I import the pug file and then execute that pug with an object that has a property name is equal to Evan, which produces an HTML string of Evan you rock. This is quite useful for conditionals and iterations, which we'll discuss later. Including templates. So you can include templates throughout Pug, which is really great for reuse. You can use you can define a template in one place and use it in multiple places and get that same template and make modifications to that one file and it'll affect your entire application. It's the reason I really fell in love with Pug because my application had a lot of duplicate code in it. Include also works to include pug files containing mixins, which we'll cover later, but this allows for the reuse of those mixins as well. File paths are relative to the current pug file, so prepare to use a lot of dot dot slash notations. 
to get to the templates that you need. So here's an example of including both a mixin file in the dot dot slash mixin slash profile.pug. We're going to pretend that contains a list of mixins, one of which is a profile. And at the bottom, you can see me including a template that says the contact me.pug. So when this gets rendered, it'll actually pull in both of those files, execute the mixin for profile, and then include all of the template in the contact me.pug. Next, we'll cover inheritance. Inheritance is as you would expect for any object-oriented language. Stating that a given HTML element extends a template will pull in the content of that file. There are customizable chunks of the template called blocks that, are, that the implementing template can modify. Here you can see two different files, my parent template and my child template. In the first, we declare p.common and then block specific details, another p.common with more content in that. At the bottom, you can see block additional details and block optional block. The child template extends that parent and implements the specific details block and also the additional details block. However, it does opt to not include the optional block. When this gets rendered, it will have this is common to every template that implements this, and then the specific details entered in the child template, my name is Evan Williams. Again, it'll have the p.common. You can even surround blocks with other elements. And then it'll have the additional details defined in the child. I prefer pug over HTML. Next, we're going to cover mixins. Mixins are a way to create dynamic templates. They're basically a set of function calls with a set of parameters that implementing templates can use to change the behavior of the mixin. It's also a convenient way to group several like templates into one file and being able to choose which portions of that file you'd like to use. Mixins must be defined prior to usage within a template. This means including the file before you use the mixin or declaring the mixin within the file and then calling that mixin. Here you can see the definition of that mixin. So I have mixin profile. It takes two parameters, name and age. It would then output a span containing hello, then the name, another span saying I hear your your age, that is, and then performs an if statement. So to use the mixin, you use the plus sign, the name of the mixin, and then pass in any parameters. In Pug 2.0, you can actually drop the entire parentheses notation if it doesn't require parameters. So what happens in this example is it produces hello Evan in a span, I hear you're 27, that is, it produces another span, old. Because that occurred because the age was above 20 and that's defined in the mixin. Now we'll cover conditionals and cases. We saw one of those in the previous slide, but a conditional is basically an if, else if, else, similar to how you would in JavaScript or many other programming languages. Variables can be used by defining them with the hyphen var variable name equals some value notation. They can also be passed in via mixins or provided by contextual. Um, so if you were to call the pug file with that con context object, you can use that to define the conditional. So here you can see I'm declaring the use first equals true and then performing an if else statement on it. Because that is inline to be true, it's always gonna render with span if use first is true, this will be used. If I were to change that in my template to be false, it would use the otherwise this, is, this will. Next, we're going to cover cases. Cases are switch functions based on the given input. The syntax for that is to have case and then the variable name that you're switching on, and then each of the cases with when followed by the value. So here we defined a string that shows multiple bananas. So you have no bananas, you have a banana, and you have a number of bananas. So if I were to call that mixin with plus show is bananas is zero, you'll see a span output with you have no bananas. Next, we're gonna cover iteration. Iteration can be done over an array in order to output many of a given template. As you'll see in the using plug, pug slide, you'll be able to render the template with an object representing the context in which you can include an array. Here we have hello to my, fo my following subscribers. And then I iterate over a collection called names. For each item in names, I produce a li element. So you can see that each definition is declared under my ul indented one, 
and then the output of that is indented also. Each of those outputted elements inside the, the for each loop will be produced at the each level. So here I'm outputting the subscribers that I know via my YouTube channel. Next are filters. Filters are used to take a given set of code and transpile it into HTML. Similar to how Pug is transpiled into HTML, Pug will actually take care of performing the transpilation prior to it making it to your JavaScript file. So this allows the transpiling of many languages, including SAS, CoffeeScript, Babel, and Markdown. And we'll show how to add Markdown transpiling to the app here. So if I were to perform npm install hyphen hyphen save dev js transformer dash markdown dash it, I now have the availability of the markdown it uh, filter. You can see in the index.pug notation, performing a filter is as simple as doing the colon markdown dot it and then calling that function. It will then take any input inside of that markdown and render that to HTML and then return it to your JavaScript. So that's all it takes. I personally only use markdown filters because it's easier to embed JavaScript notation in HTML for these particular slides. I'm going to produce another video after this showing off how my project works that I'm showing you now via the slides, um, but that's all Pug and JavaScript. So miscellaneous features of Pug. There's code, which allows you to embed code using the equal sign. It's very, very finicky to work with, and I personally avoid using it because I am more familiar with Markdown. Um, so that notation is P with an indent equals and then a string. So that string represents the code that you're going to output um, and it doesn't escape the characters. If the syntax is incorrect, I've noticed that pug loader kind of dies and needs to be restarted. That's my biggest complaint about it, but it might fit your use case. Inline tags are also extremely useful. Uh, the, there are common cases where you want to use HTML tags to highlight a piece of text, such as a, a bold emphasis, etc. And for that, you can use inline tag declarations to keep your text formatted rather well in your source code. You don't have to have a element text, element text, element text on three or four different lines. Instead, you can just inline it. So here's an example of a P element containing a text that says this is some really important text, where some really important is going to be strong or bold. So this will compile down to make some really important bold, as you can see here. That's actually in this slide's code. Comments are another new feature of Pug. They're very similar to that of JavaScript. They use the slash slash notation. So this P hello world, which is a cliche and overused, I know. I'm just using it as examples for all my slides. Um, if you add a hyphen after the comment, it doesn't render it down into HTML, meaning your end user won't see your comments, which is kind of nice to have. You can also do block comments by putting them on a new line and, and putting the comments in a block indented in that comment notation. Next there's piping. Piping is allowing the text to be on a new line or multiple lines without creating additional elements. There's two different notations for this. You can use a period after the, the element declaration. So if you saw earlier, there was a span dot common dot. That's actually putting a common class on the span and then allowing me to pipe the text. There's the other version which uses a, the actual pipe notation, but that is on the next line in front of the text. I personally use the period on the element. It makes it a little cleaner. So to use Pug in an application, if you once you've defined your file, you can import that as you would any JavaScript module. You'll want to use the file extension, both because it's required and for clarity's sake. If you have .pug at the end of your, of your import, you know that it's going to be an HTML string or a function. The imported function represents the callback in order to render the Pug template into an HTML string. You can provide it with a contextual object as we discussed earlier for interpolation. So here is a test.pug file. It contains a hello and then an interpolated name. Once I import that in my file, my JavaScript file, I can call that function with an object containing name Evan, and it'll output the P element with hello Evan inside of it. Note, if you're including files, the context still is applicable to all included templates as well. 
you don't have to worry about passing the right variables through to the child templates. This means if I had imported a template into test.pug and also had an interpolated name, I didn't have to pr provide two name variables or have to call a function specifically within my template. We'll be using this in order to define our templates for components. Angular and other frameworks allow for inlining of HTML during the declaration of components. It's very familiar if you use React or uh, Angular components where you don't provide a template URL but instead a template. So this was a lot to cover. Um, like I said, Pug's very useful in my day to day. Um, I really enjoy the syntax. I hope you familiarize yourself with it and give it a shot. Um, if anything, you can always fall back to vanilla HTML. And as always, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn or Twitter or comment and subscribe down below on YouTube. I always appreciate that. I hope you have a great day.